Welcome to the series Window of Opportunity, specially developed for Services Sita Ami host Dr. Riyad Musa. Now, to BEE or not to BEE? That is the question. Now, what is BEE and how does it affect the economy as a whole? So, with us here today are two experts, Dr. Vainan Hurson and Moketi Moshata, to help us tackle this amazing issue. Now, first, Moketi, what is BEE and what are its origins? It's a concept that the government came up with to eradicate the past irregularities uh, between the black racial group and the other racial counterparts. Now, what do you mean by black society? Like the I mean, black society, we're referring to black Indians, black uh, Africans, black colors. No, but I'm quite light skinned. Uh, <laughs> I'm also part of that. <laughs> I can't help it. I don't know if there's any white people in my like sort of. <laughs> Past, you know, things have happened. It's too hard for black economic <laughs> empowerment. I can go suntan a little bit. Now, but anybody who's non-white, basically. For sure. Um, I heard there's this new thing called broad-based black economic empowerment. Correct. And that's different from black economic empowerment. Correct. Now, what is the difference? What is, how do you even say broad, black, BBEE, -E, mm -hmm. what is that? Triple B. -E. Well, uh, Riyadh, basically uh, the, the biggest difference is, is that when we are looking at broad-based, it's as the word says, it's broad-based black economic empowerment. And if we start to look at what has happened in terms of the inequalities of the past, um, the whole legislation is geared towards uplifting previously disadvantaged individuals to participate in the economy on a same scale as everybody else. It's really to, to level the playing field, so to speak. Broad-based black economic empowerment specifically deals with a broader base of implementing BEE. In the past, black economic empowerment was very much driven on things such as an equity participation in a business, whereas broad-based black economic empowerment also looks at a, quite a number of other factors such as, for example, what are we really doing for the millions of people on the ground floor of this economy that don't really uh, get to the first ladder of development and, and economic participation, so to speak. Mm. Now, what's actually wrong with just the, the equity option? Uh, what, is, what are its shortfalls? Well, the shortfalls of the equity option is, is that it doesn't really bring true empowerment to the people. <coughs> Um, it doesn't help to simply allow people to have an equity participation if they don't really have the skills to maintain that participation. Mm. Okay. And like um, how or, or like what are the other options they, they, they can use? Well, uh, skills development, for, for, for example, is, is one of the options which is very important. Mm. Um, companies in future will also be rated in terms of what do they really do for the skills development and the overall growth and development of their staff. Now, Dr. Khosan, uh, we've got this BEE Act. Now, what are the objectives of this Act? The objectives of the Black Economic Empowerment Act is really to ensure that there is an equal participation between what is, according to the Act, considered black people and their white counterparts. The, specifically, the Act addresses a couple of issues, such as skills development, uh, equity participation in businesses, and the likes. Um, the real objective here is, is to make sure that there is a skills transfer that takes place into the, uh, can I say, hearts and minds of previously disadvantaged individuals. Mm. Now, Mukitsi, we spoke about objectives of the BE Act. Now, what are the strategies that people plan to use to implement these objectives? Basically, I'm going to talk to you about three principles involved. Yeah. One being an inclusive process. BE is an inclusive process, which means one and all enterprise participation in the South African economy. And the second one being BE as growth and strategy. And the last one being BE associated with good governance. And by that we mean it, it, it's not something that was taken from nowhere, but there's at least principles that will guide them as to what is exactly is needed or what is expected from them, from the government or the participation where BE is concerned. Now, Vainan, uh, what are the specific elements of BEE and what do businesses need to consider in terms of the Act? Riyadh, I'd like to break it up between, let's call it loosely, the big business and the small business because okay. the implementation is not really quite the same. 
I think for the small business, the emphasis is more on staff and human resource development. And for the bigger business, it starts to lean more towards the equity participation in the overall structure. Mm. Now, <clears throat> why do I make the distinction is because I think that sometimes for the small business, the equity thing is, is a difficult scenario to cope with. Mm. Um, whereas the empowerment of the staff and the development and growth of the organization is, is perhaps a, a higher priority. What I'm really getting at is I think that it is very difficult for people to start, start grasping an equity participation with staff that aren't really fully empowered and skilled towards participation. The type of fears that exist with entrepreneurs in uh, giving away, so to speak, equity in their businesses is a very real fear for, for some people. Um, they have to deal, for example, with a situation where uh, they would say to you, but what if I give away equity in my company and this person doesn't really work out, can't really do the job, decides to leave, what do I then do with, with my business? Mm -hmm. Whereas in a bigger business, in perhaps a listed company, with uh, listed shares, with stock options, etc., it becomes uh, a lot more flexible to, to try and uh, implement stuff like that. Um, when you're looking at human resource development, true empowerment, in, in, in my humble opinion, has to do with enabling people to be able to perform on certain levels. There's a lot that we talk about in terms of, of human rights, but I think black economic empowerment indirectly speaks towards responsibility as well. What do you really have to do in order to be able to maintain and function at a certain level? And I think that's, that's where companies should really aim their focus, is to empower people to be able to perform at a certain level. Now, Moketsi, um, does every single business in the country have to be compliant with BE? What if like, I've got like four people working for me, do I have to also abide by these regulations? Let's look at it this way. It's advantageous for all the companies to participate and be compliant with the BEE because you realize that lately when you apply for a tender or when you fill in a tender or when you ask for a job from a bigger company, maybe you subcontract, they would ask about your BEE standing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's advantageous, whether you are a small company with three people or four, it's really enormously important that you are compliant, because that could be to your best uh, interest when it comes to jobs, because lately you, you've realized that we all are tendering or somehow asking for business from somebody else. Mm -hmm. I want to chip in there and say that it actually makes good business sense. And one mustn't really look at this thing from a point of view of, a compliancy and do it because the law says so. Mm. One should really do it because it makes good economic business sense. Mm. How does it make good economic business it sense? It makes good economic business sense because the more people that participate in the economy, the more people actually have a ram to spend. The mm. more people that have the ability to spend, the more economic stimulus takes place, which means that the production sector is stimulated. And if the production sector is stimulated, it means that the employment sector is stimulated. So there's really a type of a uh, circle of economic development that gets kick-started. And as this thing moves, it snowballs and it gets bigger and bigger all the yeah, time. More people have money, so more people exactly. can uh, and buy more things from Indians. Correct. Yeah. Cool. And what you can actually uh, see is that or oh, maybe as you take advantage of this uh, very issue is that you can even take people that are like sitting at home not working doing anything to develop them because by that you are playing a role uh, and adding something to the BE issue and if we could even take BE, uh, BE out at the end of the day there's a development of some individual who's sitting at home and that person can be skilled and they can stand a better chance of being employed sure. maybe in a bigger company. Mm -hmm. So development options, yeah. So now let me ask you this, this is something else. What about people who are not black, who also require development, who are sitting at home and doing nothing? Ah, I don't think you're putting this in the video. What are they? I think what is important is that uh, our country needs skilled people. Yeah. We really need uh, skilled people because there's a whole lot of other things that 
we could do in our country, but we end up doing them uh, in other countries. But if people, if there's more people that are skilled, that can help the country in one way or the other. You don't have to outsource, get Indians or Cubans or whatever. We don't uh, really have to outsource have because our country would have enough uh, skilled people. Because at the end of the day, wh whoever is developed or upskilled, those people can, at the end of the day, go back and take others, which will ultimately be a circle of having our own people develop. Now, Vaina, uh, we spoke a bit about how BE will spread the, the wealth, but now how will it assist in opening new markets? Riyad, I think uh, for starters, what I would like to do at this juncture is, is maybe perhaps to, to point the, the member companies to, in the direction of the DTI website. I think that there are lots of opportunities that will be picked up from time to time with regards to black economic empowerment. Um, more specifically as to how black economic empowerment opens new markets. If you have more people participating in an economy, it means that you have more consumers. If you have more consumers, it means you have more economic stimulus, which means you have more jobs, which means that you have more markets indirectly at the end of the day. So it's really a question of starting a chain reaction to create additional markets. Uh, also remember that if we have more skilled people, we will be able to manufacture on a more and more skilled basis. And with the Rand dollar exchange rate being what it is, that can only be good for our exports. And hence, alternative and international markets may also become available in time to come. How quickly can we actually do this? Well, Riyad, I don't believe that this is something which is going to be fixed overnight. Yeah, um, not at all. I know that there is a lot of pressure, but I think it would be extremely irresponsible to try and put a time limit and to push this into a type of a 12 months uh, mm -hmm. sort of a cycle. Mm -hmm. It isn't an overnight thing. One doesn't really take uh, uh, the imbalances of the past and, and fix them within a, in a couple mm -hmm. of short years. It's probably going to take a full generation um, of South Africans to, to bring this to its, its full execution. Now, what, what can people actually do, however, to expedite this whole thing? What can they do actively? I think that, that each and every one of us have the responsibility to make sure that we, we start developing and cultivating a mindset of understanding that the development of my fellow human being is in my best interest. Mm. Um, and that isn't a nice sort of like a pop psychology type of a statement. It's a, it's a hard economic fact. Mm -hmm. Create consumers, create taxpayers. Mm. Now we really, have, we've thrown this word empowerment around quite a bit. Now what does empowerment actually mean? By empowerment we are talking about direct and indirect empowerment. And by direct empowerment we are talking about uh, equity holders, managers and executives, the people that are already within the participating or the participation of this economic uh, circle. And by indirect, we are talking about the communities and other external stakeholders. But at the end of the day, we need to realize that empowerment does not necessarily refer to somebody that you take who was a cleaner and then you take that person and make them a manager of something because that, that person, that, that at all does not mean you are empowered. Empowered it means that you have been trained to do something, you have been upskilled to do something, and now you are at the level where you can be able to put that into action. Let's, let's talk about economic empowerment and economic enrichment. Um, mm. A lot of people also throw around the term, but that's not economic empowerment, it's economic enrichment. Mm. And why? Because we've had situations where the cleaner yesterday becomes the manager tomorrow. tomorrow yeah. um, one hears horror stories about a man that actually lives in a rural part of uh, the, the country, but yet he's a director of a company and based on his name, that particular organization gets business. That is not economic empowerment and it's certainly not black economic empowerment. It's not the intention of le the legislation and it's not the intention of economic development either. It doesn't serve any real agenda. The word empowerment can... Is that illegal? It is illegal. The word empowerment, it's actually a misrepresentation. Mm. Yeah. The word empowerment should really be synonymous with enabling. And that's where I think there's a lot of confusion. To a lot of people, the word empowerment means give me a house give me a this, give me a that. It's not a give me situation. 
actually it is give me a skill and if you can give the person the skill with which to obtain then it becomes empowerment. Riyadh, remember the old story about give a man a fish and he's got food for a day. That's enrichment. Mm -hmm. Give him the ability to fish and he's got food for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. That's empowerment. Mm -hmm. What if there's no more fish in the sea? Ah, what if there's no more fish? Because, we'll because teach them to hunt. Because BE at the end of the day, or empowerment for that matter, it's not about somebody who wins uh, millions uh, from lottery. Yeah. It's, mm. it's about somebody who, even if those millions can be taken away uh, from them, they can still be able Correct. to Correct. make more millions after, yeah. after that because yeah. they were enabled and they know how to go out there and get back the millions that they lost. Yeah. Look at some of the successful entrepreneurs that's made and lost and made it back again. Huge, vast fortunes. What is money at the end of the day? Money is paper. Who gives money its value? Us, humans, gives it a value. A value which is an abstract value, really. And that value is really a reflection of our skill at the end of the day. If you look at people that, that uh, get huge inheritances or win the lotto, you always hear stories about them ending up more poor than what they were before. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the accompanying sustainable skill hasn't been brought along with, mm -hmm. with the, I really the new believe, status. I really believe that if you can empower somebody, that pen, person can be able to empower somebody else. Mm -hmm. But if you take somebody who was a cleaner and you make them managers or whatever... Just give them a title. Much, yeah, giving them mm -hmm. that uh, social standing. Mm -hmm. uh, that person cannot be able to help anyone to become what they are. And at the end of the day, we are going to we are going back to the point where we took this now manager and making he, he's going to go back and become a cleaner. Mm. And that's not what we want. What we want is the that steps. Let's follow the right procedures and protocols, and no fronting. No fronting. No fronting. Mm. Like what's fronting? Fronting <laughs> is, is when when I complete a tender and I know that. Actually, only I can do that job, but I put your name and Muketsi's name on it and say, no, look, these are my brothers from the other mother. Mm. Give me the tender. The three of us will do it. And then when we get it, the two photograph. of you... Photograph. Yeah, <laughs> photograph yeah. and all. The two of you stay at home and I've got to do all the work. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the that's, not the, that's not the intention. Yeah. Now, Vainant, uh, B is not specifically about individual upliftment. It's also about upliftment of communities. Could you explain Correct. that a little bit? Riyadh, yes. Um, corporate Social Investment, CSI. Um, take note, what is the phrase? Corporate Social Investment, not charity. Why do we say Corporate Social Investment? Because an investment really sort of prompts us towards that there would be some sort of return mm -hmm, on this sure. investment. And yes, very much the case. When we're talking about Corporate Social Investment, it, it, we are talking about situations where companies can engage in bursary schemes or uh, from time to time there are e even certain projects where uh, whole communities are being developed and, and uplifted and upskilled. Sure. That in turn again creates a market and those people become a sort of a pool of skilled people where the very same company can recruit from that pool of skilled people but also that pool of skilled people become economically active and again becomes consumers of that particular company. Mm -hmm. So there's really a type of a long-term approach to the whole scenario, if I can call it that. Right. What if you skill the people and then they go, ah, we've got skills, <laughs> let's go overseas. Look, that definitely does happen. Right. And <coughs> I don't think that one must have uh, um, try and ignore and pretend that, that that isn't the case. I think that we have a real serious problem of a brain drain in this country across the board from all South Africans, black, white, Indians, etc. Uh, I know of so many people if you if you go to functions and you say to them where are your kids and the conversation is from Australia to England to, to America. Um, I don't think that we should allow ourselves to be detracted and use that as a reason not to continue. Mm. Look, if it means we educate the world, then that's what we've got to do. But we have got to keep on focusing on developing the skills base of this country. Because if we keep on doing mm. that, we will get to a type of a tipping point and a critical mass where people will start to realize, you know what, this is a great place to be. Mm. 
because it's about a mentality that we are mm. cultivating. Mm. And if we can continuously become the leader in human development and being the, the skills base and the skills factory of the world, then we've won mm. because then what are we doing? Mm. We're creating skills and we're exporting it. Mm. So we are creating new markets. Mm. And if that's the price that we have to pay, then that's the price we pay, I suggest. Mm. Now, Mokitsi, how can you give me a couple of practical examples of how communities have actually been uplifted? I know of one of the big companies where they would take a group of, uh, of young people from high schools or f within the community and they train them on a particular skill. And after that, they give the people the certificates and at times they go to the extent where they employ those uh, young people and then they bring another group uh, after that. Eventually some of the young people had to go to outskirts uh, or neighboring towns or places where they could practicalize their skill. Now Mokesi, assume I'm a businessman. What are the practical things that I can do uh, to implement this? Where do I start? Implementing the BEE would be first to understand what uh, BE is about. It's not taking away your company from you and or maybe taking what you believe is rightfully yours. That's not what it is. But first understand what it is. And by doing that, maybe this is where the scorecard comes in. Where do I get the scorecard? At clicks? Or at pick <laughs> and pay? Well, there's now agencies that participate in helping small and big organizations in terms of implementing this, the, the BEE and making sure that the organization understands they are standing where the scorecard is concerned. DTI website has that information as well. Okay, so I go on the DTI website, I got my... Well, I... I think there's a search uh, engine there or something that can allow you to search. To get Barring the, the websites, there are also a couple of uh, very nice texts and I don't want to really promote any specific works that, that's published on, on the matter. But look, at, at any reasonable bookshop, you'll find a, quite a nice variety nowadays on black economic empowerment True. that will include the scorecard as mm, well. Mm, mm. And what I would suggest people do is, is to actually get one or two of these texts and start looking at the scorecard. And start off by a type of a self-scoring exercise and say to yourself, but where am I at? And to start <coughs> looking internally at certain objectives. For bigger companies, it can be part and parcel of the strategic planning initiative of how do we actually implement the broad-based economic empowerment uh, scorecard. Uh, also remember that your scorecard can really be used as a type of a performance measure. Um, it's also a type of a management tool, if you will. So I, I think that, that one can mustn't just look at the, this, as I said before, as a compliance issue. It, it's actually also a very good management tool. Now the scorecard, what, what's on the scorecard? The scorecard will have things on it such as uh, how do you outsource to small enterprises? What are you doing in terms of skills development per se in your organization? Uh, what are your human resources practices? What is the level of participation of previously disadvantaged individuals in your management structures? Uh, what is the level of participation in your equity structures? So it really is about looking at an overall investors and people type of strategy for your business and say, look, how do we really implement this business is about people before it becomes about money type of thinking? How big does a business have to be in order to do this? Because you said it's I don't a small think that there business. is really a, a limitation on a business being too small. Um, in this day and age, there is such a huge global need for the development of people. Uh, and, and apparently 2007 is the first of many years where we will see real global economic growth. Riyadh, you must remember that economic growth is a direct result of an increase in efficiency on an individual level, the smallest economic subject. And if the world economy is starting to grow, it means that at one level or another, people on the ground floor are starting to do things better. Well, because they're better skilled, because they're more motivated, but ultimately they produce more with less. And that's mm -hmm. what it boils down to. So, Vainat, how does this scorecard actually work? Uh, what is this, a pass-fail thing? Uh, how does the mark allocation, how does that work? Yeah, there's not really a pass or fail, but 
if one looks at the, the allocation of the points, ultimately if a company scores below 40%, it needs a bit of attention in terms of its economic empowerment. Its BE strategy really needs to, to wake up a bit. Above 65%, um, we start to look at rather good and satisfactory, and below 65% uh, is average. And, and what if I don't meet these targets? I mean, am I going to get punished? You're not uh, going to get punished, so to speak. Uh, there are no real penalties other than your participation in the marketplace mm -hmm. might not be as, as good as what you would like it to be. Uh, Black Economic Empowerment Scorecard basically gives you a credential. Uh, it gives you credibility and the lack thereof reduces your credibility, which means that it will affect your ability to attract new business. Okay, it's like almost a degree or something. That's well, it. it gives you a certain status yeah. and, and it's, it's the, the best way that I can think of to compare it is, is to say that maybe a company has a, uh, an ISO 9000 certification and if a company has an ISO 9000 certification, its clients are so much more comfortable in dealing with that organization mm -hmm. because they know they're assured of a certain quality. Mm -hmm. The same will happen with your BE status, especially when it gets to government tenders and the like. Now, Vainan, are there any deadlines involved in this? Uh, like, I mean, uh, is there a time frame within which I have to submit the scorecard and become BE compliant? Riot, uh, no specific time frame, so to speak, with sort of like a deed date at this stage of the game. But what is important, though, is, is that uh, these types of time frames and implementations are being developed across industries as we speak. And I think that one must just stay wide awake and try and stay abreast of where is a specific industry's sort of scorecard and objectives from time to time and try and, and meet those objectives. Mm. Um, again, it's not something which is really punitive directly. It is, it's something which is really developmental, if I can put it that way. But if you don't get involved in this, it's highly likely that you won't... Um, it will affect your participation. It will affect your business and stuff it's like that. a medical doctor that yeah. uh, prescribes a good medicine to the patient. He doesn't tell the patient, I'm going to actually physically punish you if you don't take it. But if you don't take it, you yeah, know what the consequences happen, are. Yeah, yeah. Now, what's the relationship between BEE and your quality management systems or QMS? Well, Riyadh, your quality management system should really reflect a certain standard of operation for your business. And your black economic empowerment uh, is in fact part and parcel of that standard. So the way I see it evolving is that in time to come your BEE status will be encapsulated and absorbed within your quality management system, mm. specifically under your human resources policies and procedures to make sure that the company again has a type of an investors in people sort of a approach. Okay. And I really think that with uh, companies that have been practicing quality management systems uh, from like way back, to a certain extent, uh, extent, they are sort of maybe way ahead with the B issue. Scorecard. It's just a matter of making sure that uh, the scorecards are in place and everything. But quality management systems, if you really practice it, it's really a good standard for they, any business. They're also doing skills implementation and stuff like that. Does that incorporate that as well? It incorporates that and it deals also with uh, good governance, if I may put it that way, in terms of uh, managing a business. There's a lot of overlap between those two sort of systems. Yeah, I think overlap, definitely uh, overlap, but more so that ultimately your BEE will become will part become. and parcel of. BEE is really a very well developed subcomponent of a quality management system if okay. you want to develop it correctly. So uh, where can I get any further information and are there any final comments? Riyadh, I think the best source of information is probably to look at the, the internet, the web, specifically the DTI website has a couple of very interesting uh, referrals on. And then, of course, the publications that are available. These days, there are quite a number of very good publications on black economic empowerment and how to implement it. And I think that everybody would be well advised to, to get a book or two. And what people need to understand is that BE is about empowering people, making sure that uh, the economic standards are taken to a higher level in making sure that everyone who has to benefit 
from this vehicle is uh, doing so and in a very nice way. So thank you very much guys. Thank you, it's been an absolute thank pleasure. And thanks to you, the member companies, for watching Window of Opportunity. See you again next time. So, so what are you going to do?